History as it happens, November 23rd, 2023. Turkey on Thanksgiving. My fellow Americans, over 350 years ago, a small band of pilgrims, after gathering in their first harvest at Plymouth Colony, invited their friends and neighbors who were Indians to join them in a feast of Thanksgiving. Together they sat around their bountiful table and bowed their heads in gratitude to the Lord for all he had bestowed upon them. This week, so many years later, we too will gather with family and friends and after saying grace, carve up a turkey, pass around the cranberries and dressing, and later share slices of pumpkin pie. Apologies to President Reagan, but the story of the first Thanksgiving is more myth than fact, and they probably did not eat turkey for dinner on that late autumn day in 1621. But millions of Americans will dine on turkey today. How did this bird migrate to our dining room tables? the centerpiece of a quintessential American feast. That's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. I hereby pardon Liberty Ann Bell. All right. Congratulations, birds. The account was written by Winslow, Evan Winslow, one of the early early settlers. It was published by a publisher called Mort in England. It was known as Mort's Relation. Relation just meant news. So he's bringing news from New England. And there's a lot of other things in this news from New England as well. But there were very few editions published. So that became quite a rare book. And it was not rediscovered by Americans until 18, the 1820s. It's found, there's a copy found in Philadelphia. And then it's republished in 1841 by a man called the Reverend Alexander Young. He was a Unitarian minister. And he's the first one to say, well, that's the first Thanksgiving. (laughs) All right, all right, get the turkeys out of the studio. Got a show to do here, my gosh. So if you are eating turkey today, don't credit or blame the pilgrims. It has more to do with Sarah Josepha Hale. We're going to learn about who she was and why turkey is a Thanksgiving tradition and why and when this holiday feast was tied to American origins. The pilgrims and the Indians, who were not aware they were celebrating a first Thanksgiving. Well, actually, for the full story about the history of the Thanksgiving myth, search for an episode titled Myths of the First Thanksgiving wherever you find this podcast. That is my conversation with David Silverman from November 2021. Today, we're going to focus more on symbols and traditions. Culture, a subject I'd like to spend more time talking about on the podcast if only wars would stop breaking out all over the world. But anyway, culture matters. Traditions matter. It would feel strange if there weren't football on television on Thanksgiving, or if the Macy's parade were canceled, or if the president didn't pardon a couple of turkeys, as Joe Biden did the other day. It's great to see you all. It's a good morning. I'm honored to welcome, welcome to the biggest edition of this wonderful White House Thanksgiving tradition. And it really is. I hereby pardon Liberty Ann Bell. All right. Congratulations, birds. Congratulations. Look, now let me conclude on a serious note about why we have Thanksgiving in the first place, to remind ourselves, and we sometimes forget this, how we have so much to be thankful for as a nation. This week, we'll gather with the people we love and the traditions that each of us have built up in our own families. Well, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, by the turn of the 19th century, turkey had become a popular dish to serve on days of Thanksgiving. And there were a few reasons for that. The bird was plentiful. One expert estimated there were at least 10 million turkeys in America at the time of European contact. Second, turkeys on a family farm were almost always available for slaughter. Cows and hens were useful as long as they were producing milk and eggs. But turkeys were generally raised only for their meats and thus could be readily killed. And a single turkey was usually big enough to feed the whole family. But there is more to the story of the Thanksgiving turkey, and that is where Sarah Josepha Hale comes in. But first, we need to welcome back Ruth McClellan Nugent, historian at Augusta University, where she is the chair of the Department of History, Anthropology, and Philosophy. Ruth McClellan Nugent, welcome back. Good to see you, Martin. It has been a year, hasn't it? (laughs) Yes, it has. You were with me, well, a year ago. We did a show about the commercialization of Christmas, the history of that. So we're changing up our holidays this time around. Happy Thanksgiving, by the way. (laughs) 
And happy Thanksgiving to you. Uh, am I allowed to ask what you're having for uh, Thanksgiving dinner? Are you having turkey or something more exciting? I, I think we're going to have turkey and, and sweet potatoes. And because it's the South, we'll have collard greens. Uh, my husband's a native Southerner, so he, he likes collards. Yeah, well, I'm going to make a turkey breast, bone-in turkey breast, with a recipe from Lydia Bastianich, the PBS chef. But anyway, that is the, the point of what we're going to be discussing here today. But before we get to the history of turkey, not the country, the food, why don't we start with the tradition of days of Thanksgiving in European and Native American, maybe all cultures. There's two things going on. The tradition of giving thanks certainly as a universal, I think, in a lot of, of cultures, giving thanks to a deity or even to the community or being grateful and having a, a sort of days to mark that, that. That's a big custom in lots of places. It's not quite the same as a harvest festival, which people think Thanksgiving is, but it really isn't quite. You know, a harvest festival could come at any time in a harvest. So we know that in a lot of Eastern seaboard indigenous cultures, there was a commonly a harvest festival when the first of the green corn came, a green corn festival that would be used to hope for the rest of the corn to be you know, better. They would sacrifice the first bits of corn. That's in the summer. And in England, there are many British people celebrated a kind of a harvest home fest when you bring in the grain crops. But Thanksgiving, as we celebrate it is very late for those things. As it became popular in New England in the 19th century, in particular 18th and 19th centuries, it's a festival that comes not only after the grain has been harvested, but also after you slaughter the animals for the winter. So you and I, we're, we're pretty far away from that at this point in the modern U.S., but at one time, even my grandparents did this. They were farmers. You know, you bring in the crops, and then you decide which of the animals are we going to support over the winter, and which ones do we slaughter now for meat and to make sausage and, and ham or, you know, whatever you're going to do with those. So Thanksgiving kind of comes after all of that, uh, and it's really a winter festival in many ways. Well, Dan day of Thanksgiving could be a day to pray. It doesn't necessarily have to be accompanied by a feast, at least in the old days, right? There were days where people fasted. Right. So Thanksgiving, the, the idea of a, of a day of Thanksgiving was common in English culture. They were introduced heavily during the Reformation as a way to give thanks for a particular providence from God. Something happens good. We win a battle the king's son is safe from disease. We have a day of Thanksgiving, and it is primarily a religious day. It is not a fast day. I mean, it is a feast day, so there may be a meal involved, but it's a religious day. And when the early settlers of New England came to, to the New World, they were called broadly Puritans. We, we call them that label. They did not call themselves Puritans. That's actually a label their enemies put upon them. But it's useful for us because we remember that they want to purify the Anglican church of any remaining Catholicism, like get every little tiny remaining bit out. They got entirely away from the idea of regular holidays. And instead they would have Sundays. So Sundays is the only holiday. And then they would have two kinds of providential holidays, Thanksgivings and fasts. So for a fast, one takes on repentance and sorrow for something bad that may be happening, and we hope to get through it. In a Thanksgiving, we give thanks together for something good that's happened. And in the early New England, those were not actually regularly occurring things. They happen when there's some kind of providence to celebrate or, or to atone for. So it is something that we find in other English colonies and, and in England to, to have a days of Thanksgiving because that was a common thing. What's different about the New Englanders is that they didn't have other holidays. They didn't have a Christmas. They didn't have right. um, all of these other traditional holidays to celebrate. They so had a those war. two kinds of things took on a, a big meaning for them. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. They had a war on Christmas. <laughs> they did have a war on yeah. Christmas, arguably as the Thanksgiving that we know, as it developed over time. It became something of a replacement Christmas. If you look at late 18th century Thanksgiving, by which time it, it, it would start to become a yearly regular thing, what's the big centerpiece is the meal, right? The big meal. Well, what's the centerpiece of a British Christmas? The meal. Americans don't always think of the meal as being the big thing at Christmas, but it really very much was. And so Thanksgiving becomes a winter holiday with a big meal, at which time we perform charity, we do good things. It has a lot in common with Christmas. Oh, that's interesting. I think we may have mentioned the Puritans' war on Christmas last year. And then, I of think course, we did. Yeah, there are the pilgrims who were even more radical. They didn't want to try to save or purify the Anglican Church. They 
would say to hell with it, right? No pun intended. They were separatists. Yeah, they, they hoped to set up their own ideal world. They fall broadly within the umbrella of the wider again, Puritan movement, or as one historian calls them, just the hotter sort of Protestant. But they were Brownist, and they had they had separated and gone originally to Holland before they came to Massachusetts. But more broadly, you know, we, we see these early settlers. They're not all religiously motivated. Some of them are coming for economic reasons. But those in control of the colonies certainly shared, one thing they did all share was this opposition to to saints' days, holidays, anything unbiblical. And so the so-called first Thanksgiving that you and I probably yeah. learned about in school, right? Yeah. Really, they would not have had a sense that this would be a continuing feast. No, no. That was my first history lesson. It's probably most kids, the first real, like, quote-unquote, history lesson they're getting. The first Thanksgiving, which it was not called at the time, the meal that did happen. There was a meal, a feast that took place in the autumn of 1621, the Wampanoag Indians and the Pilgrims. Uh, there's no evidence they ate any turkey on that day, but they did have a feast. There may have been fowl or something, or maybe even seafood, right? I mean, they were pretty close to the water. This dinner or this feast was not associated with Thanksgiving celebrations until the mid-19th century, right? There was a, a sort of a Thanksgiving because they got through the year and had food. That's, that's a providence. Right. So we thank God for that. Right. And Life was and rough there, in those days, yes. That's right. It was pretty exciting. But then the account of that was briefly published in 1622. The account was written by Winslow, Evan Winslow, one of the early, early settlers. It was published by a publisher called Mort in England. It was known as Mort's Relation. Relation just meant news. So he's bringing news from New England. And there's a lot of other things in this news from New England as well. But there were very few editions published. So that became quite a rare book. And it was not rediscovered by Americans until 18, the 1820s. It's found, there's a copy found in Philadelphia. And then it's republished in 1841 by a man called the Reverend Alexander Young. He was a Unitarian minister, and he's the first one to say, well, that's the first Thanksgiving, because to him, this looked like what we do in New England. This must have been the first. And you have to remember, the country was, was pretty young. People were looking for history and for traditions and to tie themselves to a deeper past. Uh, so that became very appealing to put that label on what they were doing at that point with Thanksgiving, which had grown up in the later 17th and early 18th centuries out of out of the tradition of Thanksgivings, but had become by kind of by the third generation of people in New England, they were less uptight about having a <laughs> yearly festival. That was okay with them. So it would be proclaimed on different days in the different colonies, but it tended to fall at the end of November or the beginning of December. By the revolution, it pretty much had that form already. So, you know, in the 1840s, it's an old holiday, right? It must be really old. That's kind of what they concluded. So this fella in the 1840s discovers this obscure reference to a first Thanksgiving, and that is the origin, the seed of what we're celebrating today, pretty much. Kind of. It's hard to pin down because, yeah. you know, it's sort of a gradual process as more and more of the colonies and then the states in the Northeast would proclaim a day. It came to be customary to do this day in the early winter. And by the way, they, they would also proclaim a fast day, which we perhaps would benefit from doing. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, that would after be in spring. Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's right. That would be in spring when you didn't have much food. You know, spring flowers are nice, but they don't feed you. So they had this kind of rhythm that began to take shape. And so by, yes, by the early 19th century, when Reverend Owen is, is, is finding this, it just seems like something they must have been doing forever. Well, you mentioned it. We needed a distinctly American origin story. And there was also, you know, Protestant overtones to this as well in the mid-19th century when non-Protestants started to emigrate to the United States. People like me, Italian Catholics, well, I'm not Catholic anymore, but you get my point. It was important to have, uh, well, Protestant culture, right, in this tradition. And I think that's part of how the pilgrims get continually brought into the story and sort of tacked on. It establishes it as this you know, very respectable, fairly Protestant tradition. Although I will point out that uh, there's a lot of Unitarians involved. So if we want to throw a curveball, I think I talked about Unitarians at Christmas with you last year. Um, right. But a lot of them are involved in the reform movements of the 19th century. And 
Part of that is pushing a good domestic family festival. And that's something that Thanksgiving is. It's a, it becomes a celebration of family. It's not a festival where you go out and get drunk and rowdy, which in the 19th century is what a lot of people did at Christmas and the 4th of July, the other two big American holidays. So Thanksgiving is very respectable. So who was Sarah Josepha Hale? What was Godey's Lady Book? And how does... Well, how do they, I should say, factor into this developing holiday tradition where we eventually get around to having turkeys on our table? Yeah, Sarah Josepha Hale is, is such an interesting person that many modern Americans have never heard of. Godey's Ladies Book is the most successful American publication of the 19th century. Mm. Antoine Godey, who was the publisher, saw the popularity of what were called gift books for women at the time. You know, and they would be collections of poems and recipes and advice, etc. And he got the bright idea to put one out on a regular basis as a subscription. It was a fairly expensive subscription, by the way. I looked it up. It was $3 a year. Now, compared to that, the Saturday Night Post, Saturday Evening Post was $2 a year. So, you know, it was pricey. And it came with advice on ma- on homemaking, on child rearing. It was famous for having these beautiful color plates of new fashions. But also, Sarah Josepha Hale promoted within it this sort of virtuous domestic womanhood. And she promoted Christmas as a family holiday and Thanksgiving very heavily. She's also a New Englander. She wrote a novel that features a big Thanksgiving scene. So you get to see exactly what she had in mind. You go to church in the morning and then you come back to the house and the ladies of the house have prepared this very big feast. The gentleman might go out shooting for a while (laughs) and there may be a community dance. Uh-oh. But that is sort of her Thanksgiving. Yeah, and she a, went on a campaign to make it a national holiday. Yeah, she she latches on to this story of the so-called first Thanksgiving. And she starts to include recipes in Godey's Ladies book. And she starts to popularize it, right? And as you say, campaign to make this not just a, a local or a regional irregular type of tradition, but a national holiday. Very much so. And she's aided by the fact that as New Englanders migrated to different parts of the country, they tended to take Thanksgiving with them. So, you know, I'm originally from the Midwest. I'm from Indiana. And part of my family is from New England. You know, I know lots of people who have that kind of background. They go to New York, they go to Ohio, they go to Indiana and everywhere they bring Thanksgiving. And some in some places there are, after the revolution, New England societies. These are men's fraternal organizations who will put on a big public Thanksgiving dinner. And you can read descriptions of them in the 19th century newspapers. They're, they're quite interesting. They have toast after toast after toast to you know the president, to our victories at sea, to all these things. And they eat food that is associated with the New England winter. So lots of apples and maple syrup and pumpkin pie. And of course, the turkey and the cranberries, all those things are coming from that part of the country. So by the time Hale goes on her campaign, there are many states where Thanksgiving has become a tradition and where Thanksgiving is proclaimed annually. And her goal was to get the president to make this a national custom. It took a while. It took all the way up till Lincoln. It took up to Lincoln, and it's really interesting because the publisher of Godey's Ladies Book insisted on complete neutrality during the Civil War, which was a really controversial idea. But obviously, you know, she's successful despite this kind of political neutrality in getting Lincoln to proclaim this in 1863. And then it becomes a sort of an annual tradition and spreads to really all across the country by the late 19th century. A source of unity. And you mentioned her uh, 1827 novel before, Northwood. She devotes a chapter to the New England Thanksgiving, and she has a a roasted turkey placed at the head of the table. But she's just not picking turkey out of Well, out of the blue, right? Turkeys were abundant in North America, right? And they're not used for eggs, so it makes, and they're big, so it makes sense that you would kill one to have a feast. Yeah, I mean, the turkey is a really interesting element. And I do want to point out there would be other meat, too. You know, there's a there's kind of a standard trope. 19th century newspapers will, will run a feature on, you know, how much food was consumed in the U.S. over Thanksgiving. And it's turkey, but it's also ham and, and lots of other meats. But turkey's a, a centerpiece. Yeah. Well, did the people in those days complain that the turkey was dry? <laughs> <laughs> I think people in those days were just thrilled to have that yes, much right. meat all at once. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let, rare, let's be right. honest. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm kidding and, because and, that's a that's a complaint about turkey. Whatever. All right. Go back to. Uh... You just have to roast it low and slow, <laughs> that's Martin. <right>. That's that's <laughs> the secret. And if you're doing a breast, try doing it in the slow cooker. Yeah. Piece of advice. Yeah. But turkey's kind of like an American bird. I mean, that's what Benjamin Franklin called it, right? 
Benjamin Franklin thought it should be our national bird, you know, very, very fierce bird. So it is indigenous to the Americas. But something important to know is that almost immediately, uh, Europeans began exporting it back to Europe because they they spot the potential of this bird. And it becomes fashionable for a time in the later 17th century for European aristocrats to have some turkeys on their estate, because it's essentially a game bird at first. It's very slowly domesticated. Really, it's not till the 20th century that the turkey is considered fully domesticated. And the turkeys that you and I get at the store today have been bred to be much larger than the wild turkey is. Uh, They have a very large breast, you know, lots of meat on it, which the wild turkeys don't. Uh, They're a much leaner bird. Have you ever ever encountered a wild turkey, Martin? Yes, I have. Actually, a whole bunch of them got in the way of my car uh, many, many, many years ago, and they would not move. And I had no idea how I was going to get out of that jam because I didn't want to run over all these turkeys. But no, you're right. We've been talking about turkey here and how people are eating this in mid-19th century. Obviously, they're not going to the supermarket to buy a frozen farm-raised turkey. They're killing wild turkeys. Yeah. I mean, they become, as I said, they become semi-domesticated and people do sort of raise them. But those turkeys are much closer to a wild turkey than than what we get today. So it is. It is a, a symbol of indigenous American foods, but we've also made it a lot fatter and uh, yes. perhaps less healthy. But that's the American way, right? Yeah, I did read, <laughs> I did read an article about this once, how these farm-raised turkeys get so big, because people want to have a big bird on the table, that they tip over and can't hold themselves up anymore. The, the turkey breast is so large compared to the, the rest of the bird. I don't, I don't know. It is quite different than what might have been traditional before. And and as I said, people eat other kinds of meat as well and other fowl. You know, goose, roast goose is very popular up until probably the 20th century. You know, it's become much less popular. It's very greasy. You know, chickens actually are also eaten at Thanksgiving. You know, all these are kind of winter festival foods. So, Ruth, according to the National Turkey Federation, an estimated 88 percent of Americans consume Thanksgiving turkey each year. So there's a little bit of room there for other things. I mean, I'm an Italian. I'd prefer to eat uh, lasagna or something, but I do eat turkey. It's it's a tradition. Uh, 46 million turkeys on a typical Thanksgiving. I mean, that's amazing. It's the only time of year I ever eat turkey, except for maybe the occasional turkey burger, but, you know, they're dry as well. But I guess, you know, what I want to get from you here is, you know, we have these traditions. We're often not quite sure where they come from. We just have this image in our mind that the pilgrims were eating turkeys with the Indians in 1621. I mean, that's not the case. But whether it's accurate doesn't matter. What matters is the symbols, the traditions, culture matters to people. And if you contravene the prevailing ideas, you can get yourself in a little bit of trouble these days, especially when it comes to a very American holiday like Thanksgiving, which not everyone celebrates. I think a lot of families now feel pretty free to to experiment with their Thanksgiving dinner, to bring in their own ethnic traditions, for example. A lot of what we think of as the traditional Thanksgiving is, is really cemented in in the 20th century, Franklin Roosevelt, who who sets it on the date that we have it now, after moving back and forth with some different uh, which Thursday it should be. Oh, I didn't know that. And yeah. Thanksgiving is kind of set as a way in the 1930s to kick off the Christmas shopping season. Ah, uh, um, there we had to have a commercial angle. Go ahead. Yeah. Had to have a commercial angle. So the big parades of the of the 20th century, the big parades like the Macy's and other department stores would have a parade to get everyone into the civic spirit of Thanksgiving and then hope that you come shopping at their stores for Christmas. Um, Well, we know who brings up the rear at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. (laughs) Yes, it's Santa Claus. It's Santa Claus. So, I mean, that's that's one of the interesting things, too, about the United States is that we now have a winter festival season that sort of starts in Thanksgiving and then finishes around New Year. We're not that different in some ways from medieval peasants who took this time as holy days to, to not do their work. But if you work at any big company, good luck getting stuff done between mid-November and the end of December. Everyone's taking time off. You know, there's other holidays that pop up in there, like Hanukkah, for example. But we do kind of have this whole dark time of the year where we eat a lot and we celebrate and we have a good time. Yeah, and the day after Thanksgiving, you're supposed to go shopping. Or even on Thanksgiving, recently, retailers have been doing sales, which I think is terrible to have your workforce in the store on 
on the holiday. But, you know, I mentioned before about how not everyone celebrates Thanksgiving. It is a day of mourning for some uh, Native American people. One of my neighbors in my apartment building is from the Caribbean, and she told me the other day she does not celebrate Thanksgiving. There's a darker connection here to, well, European colonization, the, the period of discovery, so to speak, Columbus, and so on. And it's interesting because historically, Thanksgiving doesn't really become a thing until a lot of the most violent episodes of colonialism are done. Nevertheless, because Americans in the 19th century and the 20th century tacked on those images, it it is associated with a whitewashing almost of history. I mean, yes, there was a feast at which the Wampanoag and, and the pilgrims cooperated. And yes, the early Wampanoag did make alliances with the pilgrims. But it was always an uneasy and fraught alliance. And, you know, after King Philip's War in 1676, things looked pretty different. I think you're right that for many people, even if that's not the actual history, the images that have been brought up and associated with it become very painful, you know, for people who are members of, if they're tribal citizens, uh, if they're from, you know, other parts of the world where they have bad associations with those, uh, it can be a bit off-putting for some. I'm glad you brought up the issue of how uh, Native Americans were kind of reintroduced into this story after the the Indian Wars had ended in the 19th century. Because at that point, especially for Eastern Americans, it would have been hard for them to associate the image of Native Americans with a threat to their safety safety and security. So now that they are gone, driven off the land, and close to being exterminated in some places, uh, a very non-threatening or friendly image of Native Americans can be reintroduced into mainstream American culture in the form of sitting down with the pilgrims and you know, praying together and eating together or whatever. There's some very dramatic paintings, renditions of that first Thanksgiving, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, and I mean, the, and the irony is, of course, that they're not really disappeared. You know, the Wampanoag are still there. Tribal peoples are still all over much of the U.S. In Massachusetts, for example, they're just incredibly marginalized and, and on the fringes. And, you know, there's this genuine attempt in the 19th century to sort of erase their culture completely, you know, take the children and send them to residential schools, for example, and, and not let them speak their own language. If that's what Thanksgiving conjures for you, because, you know, in your family, your family lost their language, they were forced to go to re- abusive residential schools, of course, you're going to have a very different image. And, and you're right, some of those I mean, some of those images are, are almost laughable when you see pictures of, of people with, they've sort of got the big feathered headdresses of yes. the Plains tribes in New England, yes. or I think of the really unfortunate school plays that we did when, when I was a kid. People would dress up in these supposedly tribal costumes, which I'm sure are horribly offensive. There are a lot of those complications to the holiday. And, yeah, and as American societies become ever more diverse and we have more and more immigrants from different parts of the world coming here, this holiday, like all, will will change and will evolve. Uh, I don't really sense, at least in my circle here, uh, many people talking about pilgrims and Indians very much anymore. You know, Thanksgiving is simply a day now to, well, I don't want to say simply a day, but it is, it is a day where people have off from work, hopefully. They get to see their family that they haven't seen maybe all year long and sit down and just have a dinner and be thankful for whatever, not necessarily linking it to some American origin story anymore. Which is entirely appropriate. I mean, gratitude is a central practice in so many different religions and spiritualities. Um, And if you think of it that way, it could become a day to celebrate gratitude and connections connections to your family. You know, we had this story of a connection to a past, which perhaps is not actually there, but it makes us feel connected to other Americans. And even if we do, if we eat even some of the traditional foods, I do like to think that we're connecting to actually something very real, like foods that are from the United States. Um, And maybe we blend those with lasagna that's been brought here by (laughs) Italians. But uh, I, I think that's, that's actually pretty neat if we can do that, because that's a very American thing to continue to adapt and evolve, but keeping it meaningful. Kidding around here about not really liking turkey. It would be weird not to have turkey on Thanksgiving, just because I'm used to doing it that way. These symbols, when we have holidays, there's certain things we do. We don't always know why they do them, but that's what evokes the holiday for us. It's a sort of a ritual, as much as as crossing oneself is a ritual or, or other rituals that we perform in a religious sense, or throwing out the first baseball of the season is a ritual that evokes, okay, now it's baseball time. Well, at Thanksgiving, it's the food that really evokes it. And you mentioned commercialization, Martin. What, I'll just put this in there. Yeah. I mean, Thanksgiving has a lot of connections to commercialization, but one of the things I do sort of like about the holiday is... It's harder to commercialize a family meal 
than many other holidays. You know, we're not buying presents for the whole world. We're not doing all these things publicly. There's not a lot of public display at Thanksgiving. So I, I think in some ways it, it does get to that, what you're talking about, that sitting with the family, spending time with people. That's, I think, what a lot of us like about it. And watching football. And for the longest time, I would wonder... Or the Macy's Parade. That's right, and the Macy's Parade. Wonder why the terrible Detroit Lions always had to be on (laughs) Thanksgiving. (laughs) They're having a good year. It's also an opportunity for people to actually learn something if they listen to a podcast like this one. I hope they will look up Sarah Josepha Hale and read about this remarkable woman Born in 1788, she became, as you said, one of the most influential female voices in the entire 19th century. Don't know about you, but I've got a very exciting weekend coming up. On Saturday, November 25th at 9.15 a.m., you can catch me on C-SPAN Live on Washington Journal, taking viewers' phone calls, talking about the podcast. And then on Saturday night, 7 p.m. on C-SPAN 2, American History TV, 90 minutes of me and Ken Hughes talking about John F. Kennedy and the coup that toppled South Vietnamese President Ngo Dinh Diem in 1963, 20 days before Kennedy himself was assassinated. And in upcoming episodes of History As It Happens, yes, we will return to some depressing subjects, including the war in Israel. We're going to look back on the 1982 invasion of Lebanon to see if there are any useful parallels there to understand what might be next for Israel and the Palestinians. And we're going to talk to historian Samuel Moyne about his provocative new book about the Cold War liberals, liberalism against itself. That's coming up on History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times.